Hello out there and welcome to the My Grocery Adventure podcast. My name is Carly Wharton and I'm your host of this show where this is a podcast for people who want to make an impact. And my particular impact part of it, the big part of it came through, you probably guessed it, grocery. Um, but there's lots of ways to do that. So this show will encompass all kinds of stories of people who have shown up in ways where they were able to make a real impact in the world. And sometimes maybe that's on a grand scale, but often it's on an ordinary moment to moment kind of scale. So those are really the stories that this podcast will capture where truly each and every one of us has something inside of us that we can use to show up in the world and make our own impact, no matter what size that is, there is no, no impact too small. So if you're joining us for the first time, welcome. This is the first episode that we are ever recording. So um, if you're catching up with us from the very beginning, welcome as you join us on this new part of our My Grocery Adventure journey. Um, I am joined today, our very first guest as we dive in, um, he was very willing to kind of fly the plane while we're building it. So he makes total sense as the first guest, um, Tom Mulholland, and he is a fellow grocery owner and has just a fascinating story. No intro or biography is ever going to do it justice, which is why I'm super excited to get to dive in during this episode and uncover and get to see kind of the process of, you know, not just making a big impact in the bright, shiny thing that maybe we can think that that is, but ultimately the real process, the real journey of it, step by step behind the scenes. Um, this is a space where we're going to get to bring that out into the light. So we, we have a better better understanding of ultimately what it means to make an impact in the world. So again, thank you so much for joining me. Those of you that are watching, if you're listening only, you actually can watch. There's a YouTube channel as well, My Grocery Adventure. Definitely feel free to head on over there. I would love to interact with you in the comments if you're called in that direction. Um, I think that's it. Without further ado, Tom Mulholland, thank you so much for joining me and welcome to the show. Good morning, and thank you very much. I appreciate it. Oh, gosh. It is my pleasure to be here. I feel like my grocery adventure has been coming to life maybe my whole life, you know? And there were definitely stages where I knew more about what I was doing than than even now. I think there's still a lot to come that maybe we don't even fully understand the adventures that we're really on. Um but today, I am super excited to get to hear about your specific journey. And I would love if we could dive right in kind of all the way back at the beginning. Like, where where were you born? Where did you grow up? What was that like? I live and was born in Malvern, Iowa, which is in the southwest corner. Um, we're about 15 miles from the Missouri River and about 30 miles from the Missouri border. I commuted to Omaha for many years in, in uh, my working career. You know, as for the grocery business, uh, I started out working Saturdays, working summers at my grandfather's and then my father's store. Uh, my great grandfather actually started it in 1875 with a partner as a dry goods store. And eventually groceries took over. My grandfather put a small section in back in the 19 teens and uh, that, that eventually took over. When my grandfather retired, the meat cutter that was here said, I want to be made a partner also. And if you don't, then I'm leaving. And, and he'd been here. He was an important part of the business. That wasn't something that my father knew much about. So the two of them became partners in 1972 and uh, had it for many years between the two of them. So that's that's a brief start to my story. Absolutely. Um, how how many people are in, did you say Melbourne or Melbourne? 
At, at this point, there's just over a thousand in Malvern, a uh, thousand and fifty, I believe, is the actual population. It's been a little bigger at times, and it's going to be bigger in the future. There's a lot of growth going on right now. Our school district is adding on to our high school, turning it into a, a K through 12 school. Uh, we've got a new 50 unit housing subdivision being built uh, that's just started here in our community. And right in front of that, there's an old rest home uh, that had been empty for a while. And the school district has bought that, working with a number of different volunteers and organizations. They're turning it into a large child care center that would take up to like 175 children in it. And that's going to be huge for the community because they'll be bringing people in from all around the community. Something like that also means that instead of our grade school being seven miles out in the country, now it's going to be here in the community. So we're gonna have those after school shoppers coming in that are picking up the kids. We're gonna pick up a lot more business that way, the new housing subdivision, et cetera. More people working in the community with the school, with the, the child care center, those different types of things. And more possible employees with the new uh, housing subdivision. So it's all things that are working in favor of my small town store. I love that. I love that. Um, what, what point did you leave Melvern and then like kind of what took you away and then when did you come back and what brought you back? Okay. Um, I had a hard time getting along with my dad's partner. My dad was a very small man, uh, meek and mild and, and didn't want to argue with anybody. His partner had been an all-state football player. He was bright because he was bigger and louder in many situations and, and that's the way he acted. And I just couldn't deal with that anymore. I uh, had started full-time at one point to learn to cut meat. And I enjoyed that. I went to a meat cutting school in uh, Sioux City, Western Iowa Tech. I thought I could learn more, learn a little bit faster. You know, it's nice to get direction from more than one person and learn more than one way to do things. So even though my dad's partner, Cork, was a very good meat cutter, I thought I could learn more and do it faster by doing that. So I did. I went to work at a small town locker near here uh, and lived in that community for a little while. The owner there was a very good meat cutter, but not a great businessman. And he told, I was the only one in there that was not family. He told us at one point, he said, I think you boys should find new jobs because the IRS is going to shut me down. So I was ready to move on someplace and I didn't really have any exact plans. Lots of construction going on in Texas at that point. And I was thinking about following some of my classmates down there into a field I'd never done before. But right then my dad said, we really need more help with the store. I'd appreciate it if you'd come back here. So I did. I worked there for a number of years, uh, got married and was was working there, living in Malvern, had, had her first house. In uh, 1988, I just could not get along with my dad's partner anymore. There were issues and I left. I started working in Omaha and it was a very small store. It was actually smaller than our small town store, but the reputation that it had was unbelievable. Um, I worked there for a month short of 20 years. I started as a meat cutter, but with, within a year, I was a co-manager of the meat department and things just continued to improve. The small little store, Walner's Grocery, uh, the reputation, we had all of the doctors and all the lawyers in town shop there. Uh, Warren Buffett uh, lived just a few blocks away. Each state only has two U.S. senators, and both of the Nebraska senators were customers at that point. Um, the TV stations liked working with a smaller store. And so we were well known to all of the reporters. If they had any story that had to do anything with food, they usually came to Walner's. There was one point where I was interviewed in two days. I was interviewed by three channels for three different stories. 
and I was probably interviewed, you know, dozens of times over the years that were live or recorded for later on. Uh, the Wall Street Journal wrote a story about if you're coming to Omaha for the College World Series, you've got to go try the Bronx of Walters for your cookout, for your uh, parking lot adventures. So, you know, we really had a lot of publicity. Uh, I learned how to make sausages, how to smoke bacon and different things like that. We uh, shipped meat all over the country. Omaha Steaks is well known, but the quality we used was higher. And even though we didn't have a, a deal worked out with the shipping companies, uh, the price usually came out the same to what they were doing with higher quality and you could get whatever you wanted. So I learned a lot of things. There was one day that I was working and I thought to myself, you know, it's 9 a.m. and I've already worked with USDA Choice and prime beef, Kobe Wagyu beef. We were the only store in Omaha to carry that at the time. Uh, fresh lamb, veal, pork, chicken, turkey, three types of seafood by 9 a.m. or smoked products that we were doing. I mean, the, the experiences that I was able to gain working in this store, you know, not many meat cutters in the world could rival those and match those. So I gained so much experience. Um, there was a newspaper article that called me possibly the best meat cutter in Omaha. And for a community the size of Omaha with, with a reputation for meat, that really meant something. As I said, I worked there for about 20 years. The store back in Malvern at that point, my dad and his partner could no longer get along. So a few years after I left, they split. My dad decided he was close enough. One of them had to buy the other one out. My dad decided he was close enough to retirement age that he would just go ahead and retire instead of trying to take over the whole thing on his own and, uh, you know, digging a hole possibly. So Cork ran it on his own for a few years and he developed cancer and needed to retire. I looked at buying it. I talked to people from the grocery warehouse. I was, I was really interested in putting the family name back on the business. And I just decided that I was too young. I was in my early 30s. I thought I needed to get more experience before I did that. A few years later, that first owner after Cork, he put it up for sale and I heard that it was for sale. I went in and somebody said, he's gone now, come back at one o'clock. So I did. And I walked in and I talked to him for a moment. He said, I've got a meeting. He said, come back at two o'clock and we'll talk. He knew what I was there for. At two o'clock, I walked in and there they are shaking hands. He just sold the store to somebody else. And that really hurt. Fast forward another 10 years. You know, my experiences, my reputation, my knowledge had just grown over that time. And the those young owners, they decided they wanted to get out. He wanted to run a restaurant. He'd started doing catering, had a hot deli in the store, and he decided he really enjoyed that more than the grocery business. And... I was the first one that they called. They knew that I had tried to buy it before. They felt bad that uh, it didn't go back into my family, but they called me and we made a deal. I talked to the grocery warehouse. They said, we're trying to get this done, trying to get all of the paperwork done. Do you think it's possible to do everything in six weeks? And he said, yeah. I said, that, that's, oh, six weeks, not months. Oh, wow, that's going to be very tough. But we did it. I was working 50 hours a week at my regular job. I was spending another 40 hours a week probably filling out paperwork for all the different licenses and things that we had to have with the state, with WIC, with uh, food stamps, things like that. So we got everything done. And on Mother's Day of 2008, you know, the store belonged to my wife and myself finally. We kept it closed for a day while we did a major cleanup. Uh, the, the previous owners had taken a lot of vacations, had a family home down in the Ozarks, 
And so they, they left it to the employees to run a lot. And, and when nobody's watching the employees and giving orders to the employees, then they kind of let things slide. And that's where things were. The first little bit was a learning curve for me, but we passed that uh, previous owner's last year's sales with 100 days to go in our first year. So things were really moving along decently. The problem was this building was 140 years old and the equipment was very old. So there were always lots of repairs, lots of money we were putting back into the business. We put in new lights uh, that first year because only about half of them worked. We, and, you know, we were able to find uh, energy grants and things like that. So we got 80 or 90 percent of that paid for. Uh, so it was you know, a smart decision. And, and then they paid the rest of themselves off with the energy savings on the new, more efficient lights. We put in new freezers and uh, milk cooler. And again, those things probably paid for themselves very quickly because of how old and how inefficient uh, the previous things were. When they were tearing out the freezers, at one point they had to stop and wait for about three hours because there was a hole in one of the freezers and they had a chunk of ice holding it to the wall about that bit. So lots of things that we needed to do and that we did do. And, uh, you know, I was just working my tail off trying to teach somebody else to do these things and to give up the idea that, yeah, maybe I can do it better, but if they can do it 90% as well and take some of that load off of me, then it would be better off, you know, and I'm just, I'm learning that now. Um, I went through the Goldman Sachs 10,000 small businesses program. And that was one of the things that, that we learned there that, uh, you know, onboarding your employees as you hire them, uh, taking the time to, to delegate, to teach them how to do some of these things is going to make your business better in the long run. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get to that point. And I do appreciate that. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so that was awesome. And I would love to unpack some of what you offered there. Um, one of the, the first questions, and I had this, the time that we sat together last time was like, when you decided in your early thirties that you don't yet have enough experience, can you talk us through a little bit, like, like what what was specifically the lack of experience or can you say more about, yeah, like what led you to that conclusion at that time? Just, just talking to the person from the warehouse at that point and thinking about all of the business aspects of it that I didn't know anything about uh, really had a lot to do with that. Um uh, you know, a few years later, there was a, a grocery store in a neighboring town that came up for sale. And I started looking at that. And it was a little bit bigger, a lot busier. And, and I gave that some consideration. And the first thing they asked was, you know, what about your business plan? Um, I don't help know how to do a business plan. So I started doing some research on that. I found that Creighton University had an adult education class on writing a business plan. 13 weeks, if I remember right, 10 or 13 weeks, something like that. Um, I, I went and did that. You know, I was trying to find ways to further my education to get, make myself stronger and get myself to the point where I could do that type of thing. And you know, that was one of the ways that, that it worked out. So um, I had decided at that point that, yes, I, I do believe I am ready. And I was looking for the opportunities now. But, you know, they don't always come when you want them to. So I had another friend that, that ran a grocery store in a neighboring town. And when I wrote my hypothetical business plan, I wrote it up as if I was buying his store. Uh, again, his, his store had a lot of good points about it. He was having some health issues and, and thinking about getting out. So it was a good tie-in, uh, a good way to do that. Became close friends with him. And, uh, you know, I went and helped him when he was on vacations and did things that I could. So just 
not only gaining more knowledge, but gaining more contacts and things like that throughout the industry and throughout the area. You know, I think that's always a good thing. So I wonder, do you think that the experience at the locker where the guy was like, go find a different job because I'm I'm getting shut down? Like, do you think see like being so up close to somebody who's lack of business experience had caused them to lose their business like do you think that was like in your head at all as you're like i'm not ready do you know yeah I, mean? I i do i mean that's that that's something that that opens your eyes definitely uh Reality just check. because and that's you know that was one of the reasons thinking back to that that was one of the reasons where i had decided i don't have enough experience because i could see that this person was very good at one aspect of the job. Mm -hmm. And that is something that I also had good experience in, but not the business side of it. So I think that's what held me back at the first time. And, and while I really hadn't thought about it that way, then yes, that absolutely was one aspect of my thoughts uh, at that point. Yeah. But again, I worked at learning more and, and, uh, and doing some things. I, was you know and it wasn't much but i was the treasurer of our local golf course for a little while so that gave me a little bit more experience on learning how to do some of the tax forms and things like that 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 needed to be done the quarterly taxes etc so the, the state came to me at one point just after i'd taken over and they actually came in the store and it's about 1130 in the morning and two guys in suits come walking in. And they said, well, we need to speak to Mr. Mulholland. And, you know, I assume that meant my father. So he's at lunch right now. He'll be back in a little while. And they said, OK, we'll wait. So they just stand around and stand around. And, and finally, my dad's partner spoke up, said, well, you know, I'm Mr. Mulholland's partner. What can I help you with? And they said, well, no, we're actually here about the golf course. And, oh, they said, that's me. Well, the previous secretary treasurer had not done the tax forms for about two years. We didn't know anything, but there was a $10 fine for not doing all of that. So they sent two guys in suits from Des Moines two hours away to come in and make sure that these were all taken care of and that, that was also a learning experience for me. So <clears throat> you've got to get those that paperwork done. Right. Again, I feel like you have kind of several experiences, it sounds like, where seeing the yeah. consequences of not having the experience that you need and like that hesitation of I'm not ready yet. Like, I mean, it makes sense <clears throat> based on what you lived. And right. like, that makes sense that you would have felt that way. Well, and then there's also things that I did wrong when I did it by the business. You know, I don't know enough about this. I don't know enough about that. There were times where we'd have a breakdown. Uh, the refrigeration isn't working. And I call my refrigeration guy. He's in a town about 20 miles away. And, you know, he'd get over here as fast as he could. And, oh, you've just got a fuse that will move. Well, I didn't know what I was doing and didn't know where to check. And, and, you know, some of those small, stupid things like that, I did learn. And, you know, that's the type of experience that I could have used earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, it would have saved me money. The first year or so, you know, my, my grocery warehouse would have food shows, uh, usually in Minneapolis at that point, and have them twice a year. Well, I didn't make it because I was too busy learning and trying to run things uh, those first couple of times. But there were special deals and things like that uh, where I could save money. When I did start going, you know, unfortunately now I'm, I'm in a small town, but I'm thinking, you know, I'm, I'm a big shot. I'm buying stuff now. And, and uh, you know, I, I can you know make deals with these people, you know, go and uh, there's deals on ice cream. Well, I'm going to, I'm always going to sell ice cream, you know, and I, I overbought. Even things like that, you know, it, it got, some of it got outdated. So, you know, I had to learn to think a little bit more carefully about that. I learned that it isn't worthwhile for my business, for as small as I am, to buy 
two cases of green beans, you know, to come in three months from now because I can save a quarter a case. Well, that that savings is not enough for me to guess whether I'm actually going to need those or not uh, at that point. Uh, some of the different things like that, you know, I had to start looking at, are these savings actually worthwhile to tie up my money? Uh, do I have the space? Do I do I have the money to be buying so many things to be coming in right before Mother's Day, Memorial Day, something like that? Uh, uh, you know, a pallet of paper towels and a pallet of water, uh, you know, both in the same week. And my employees really have to struggle to get those things out of the way so that we can uh, have room for their next deliveries. Mm. You know, it's, it's experiences like that that go through. You, you know, you don't learn until you've made some of the mistakes. And, and you know, it wasn't just my money. It was also my space, my lack of ability to get some other products in later on, possibly. So there's, there's things like that that, you know, I wish somebody had taken me under their wing a little bit more and shown me some of those things. But you learn the hard way. And, you know, I've tried to be transparent with other business owners that, that I work with, talk with. And, you know, why should you make the same mistakes I did if I can show you? Sometimes, yeah, that's the only way you were going to learn. But, you know, I, I try to help as I can and pay it forward. I'm in a Facebook group called the Leaders Network. And this is a, a group of business owners, business managers from across the country that Facebook puts together. You know, it's basically by invitation only. You have to answer questions, go through a vetting process. When I got into it, there were about 600 people in it. Now there's about 2,000. But, you know, you can go in there and you can ask questions. And, and these people don't feel like they're your competition. They're there to help you. And if there's any way that, that I can share some of my experiences, some of my wisdom, uh, you know, I I didn't get this gray hair, you know, without spending a lot of time in something. And, you know, I, I try to share as I can and make it worthwhile for somebody. Someone asked some questions the other day. They were thinking about some different ways of handling their business. And they, they commented about, well, I built this baby, you know, and... You know, I told him, I said, you did this, you built your business out of passion, out of love. And now I think it's worth giving it a little bit of time and, and doing what you have to. Uh, and, and they appreciate my thoughts and the way that I made them look at it. You know, there's a lot more to it than that. But, you know, the, there's different ways that, that businesses can help each other. I've been asked to speak at numerous conferences and uh, I spoke at a state economic development conference called the Iowa Star uh, Conference years ago. And one of the things I try to get people to understand, especially in a small town, is that the businesses should work together, should do what they can together. You know, don't think about that business next door. You know, I'm in a grocery uh, store. I shouldn't think about that coffee shop next door, that art gallery next door as my competition but I should work with them. When I advertise on the radio, one of the things that I do is I talk about the town festivals or events that are going on. Uh, I might talk about some of the other businesses and what they're doing, because if I can give those people that are listening three or four reasons to come to my community, I've got a lot better chance of getting them in my store instead of just saying, hey, come see me. Yeah. I did have a lot of customers that came from 30, 40, 60. I had people that came from 150 miles away to pick up some of the sausages that I made, the bacon, the things like that. And, you know, it improved my whole community because they're going for lunch at the restaurant while they're there. I had people that would come to town. They're going to go to the doctor next door. They're going to stop and get groceries. I got to go pick up medicine at the pharmacy. We're in town. Let's go down and have lunch while we're here. You know, if the businesses will work together and promote each other, make the town much stronger, you know, it's important and it's going to help a lot and it helps everybody. You think about the taxes that are being paid, you know, that helps improve your roads, 
your fire department, different things like that. It helps in so many ways. And if you think about it that way and, and try to do what you can, it can make a big impact. Yeah. yeah. A rising tide raises all ships. I mean, that's what's good for me is good for my neighbors and vice versa. <laughs> We're all in this yeah. together. <laughs> Oh, yeah, but so, so many people don't think about things that way, and, and oh. you know, I gotta get, I gotta get those customers that are going in next door. Yeah, but if you work together and bring more customers for both of you, yeah. that's that's even better. Yeah, yeah, it's like a scarcity mindset or like a an abundance mindset. Like, is there only a limited number of dollars and customers and whatever that we're kind of all scrappily fighting over, or is this yeah. something where, you know, like we're all going to add value and we're all going to receive value in return. And the more we can cooperate with each other, I think another benefit is that it makes it just a nicer like network within the community, you know, to like skip the tension right. of being in competition with each other. And if anything, right. there's another, another piece of competition that I think is really fun, which is, you know, it's not all bad the competition like if you see somebody who is making you feel like ooh they're you know they're going to steal my customers or whatever like what are they doing and is there something that you want to innovate and you know switch up inside what you're offering because maybe exactly. that that fear of like oh crap like my customers are going to go over here now like well i mean if you're giving them value that they can't live without they're not going anywhere and so if you're thinking they you know they're maybe leaving like maybe there's something else that you can put into your offering or a new product you want to bring in or you know like you were saying go to the food shows and get a bunch of new stuff coming so you have something to like draw them back in there so th that signal of feeling like oh crap like I'm in competition and like I, I gotta fight for for my piece of the pie it's like you know, there's a healthy way to channel that. Like if it is maybe, maybe unavoidable, I don't know. Um, I think it could definitely be pretty normal to think, especially on the weeks where, like I remember in our first couple of years where, God dang it, like the ends just almost don't meet or they really don't. And then try to cooperate with like, the other store down the road like I get it right. it it it's normal I think when when you're feeling your your piece of the pie is threatened and so what you're no. describing it's like you know you kind of found your groove and you had enough that there was like you know let's let's all kind of pull in together and you know there's enough to go around here and that's easier to see I think when you do you know when your ends are meeting personally so it's, it's maybe a spectrum, but I'm, I'm right there with you as far as like, you know, cooperating with what's going on, like getting them in town, using the festival, you know, you don't have to be the sole reason that they're coming into your town in order to benefit from the fact yes. that they did like that's yeah, exactly. Right. Exactly. Yeah. 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 I've been very lucky in my business life that I've had good mentors. I've had good leaders above me. You know, I talked about the uh, locker owner. He was a very good meat cutter, and I learned some things from him. Mike, my boss in Omaha that I worked for for 20 years, you know, he was third generation in his store. Uh, it recently, he, he's retired now, but it recently celebrated its centennial, its 100 years in business. You know, so that was fantastic. Um, but I learned a lot of things from him. You know, he advertised on the radio. And I, I learned by watching that, you know, Omaha is a lot different uh, situation than what I'm in in a small town. But I'd hear the customers say that, you know, I, I've heard your radio ad for the last six months and I drive by here all the time. And I just, you know, I just decided I had to come in after hearing that. So I learned that it isn't going to hit. You can't put a radio ad out and boom, the next day, everybody's coming in. It takes time. You've got to be consistent with things. Mm -hmm. But I learned some things from that. Um, you know, my dad, I, I learned uh, how to treat the customers. You know, as I said, he was kind of meek and mild, but he was very friendly. He was very personable with the customers and, and everyone respected him 
And I, I appreciate that. I bought my business in 2008. You know, four or five years later, we had put a lot of money back into the store, not always because we wanted to, but because we had to. You know, we put the new lights in and that helped. They, they ended up not costing that much and paid for themselves. The freezers, you know, that, that was a big chunk of money. But then with the business, with the building, with the uh, equipment being so old, there were always lots of uh, repairs that had to be made. And things were tough. You know, it was getting to the point that my bookkeeper and I would be talking. So, you know, I think we let this bill go for another week or two. We've got to get this one paid and, and things like that. You know, the employees always got paid. Uh, but I was also cutting back a little bit on employees. Well, I can work a little bit more. I, you know, I'm here at that point. I don't need to have someone there. You know, so things like that. And, and again, it just added to my hours a little bit more. Uh, again, I got lucky. I saw an email that came out from the Small Business Development Center here in Iowa from our, our regional one, and it talked about a business pitch contest. And, oh, it said that the deadline for entry has been extended, and I hadn't seen anything about it before. And, you know, I, I think I could do this. I think I could do well in this. And it had a $5,000 first prize. What you had to go on Facebook and asking your customers to vote for you each day. And there were over 30 entries in our region in Iowa, and they had 10 different regions, the 10 different small business development centers for the state that were doing this. And the, the uh, contest was called Dream Big Grow Here. And, you know, the deadline for the, the votes is coming up. The top five are going to make it and that they give, their pitch for the $5,000. And we were going back and forth in about fifth and sixth place. And we're down to that last day. And, and you know, we're in and out of that top five. And, and you know, we made it. We, we made it in fifth place with some other places getting a lot more votes. So, you know, I started putting my pitch together and we went to Iowa Western Community College and presented our pitches one evening and, and had a panel of judges, uh, three different uh, business people from around the state. And you know, I won. So I won that $5,000, which helped a lot. You know, we were able to keep going. But then those 10 regional winners were going to go to the state finals uh, about four months later. And that was all the way across the state in Cedar Rapids. And this time there would be a $10,000 first prize. I worked on that pitch. I took that pitch, the PowerPoint presentation. I've never done a PowerPoint presentation before. This is my first experience with that. I've never been in a contest like that before. And I worked on it. We have eight minutes to give our presentation. And, you know, I, I mean, I'd, I'd read it. I, I probably read it 500 times out loud to myself in my office at home, something like that. And if I give a little pause right here, that gives it more dramatic effect. If I change this one word here. And when I got to Cedar Rapids, you know, they've got a lot of things going on. This, this event is called Entree Fest. And it is for small business owners from all across the state in all different industries. And there's a lot more technical aspects of business on the other side of the state, you know, where University of Northern Iowa is, Iowa State, University of Iowa. So that's why it's on the other side of the state. There isn't that many things uh, that, that meet that, that type of standards here. So I, I drove all that way and all day long, I worked on just tweaking my presentation a, a tiny bit. And like I said, a different word here, a pause there. I gave my presentation that night. I was the third out of the 10 to do that. And I actually, they, they said, well, you know, when the music starts playing, you're done. Your eight minutes are over. I had about a half of a sentence to go, but I, I stopped. But I really thought that I did a good job in that. And everyone finishes up 
the judges leave and they come back. Kim Reynolds, our lieutenant governor, gets up on the stage and she mentions, you know, who got third place. And, and you know, they did a very good job and I was impressed. And second place and I didn't get that. And, you know, I think if I remember right, that was $1,500 and $2,500 for the second, third place. And that would have helped my business a lot. And then they announced the winner and it was me. And, you know, I just dropped my head because I was so shocked that money meant a lot to the business. But more than that, you know, that allowed us to pay some of the bills you know, that, that we needed to, to do some different things. But more than that, the, the press, the notoriety that we gained, uh, the connections that I made it is the SBDCs that are, that are handling this. And I met so many people from there, so many uh, other people that are interested in economic development and in small communities. I won other awards after that that were basically just follow-ups to this. I commented earlier out about speaking at the Iowa Star Conference. Well, that was, you know, shortly after this that I was invited to that because they'd heard me here. Um, it, it turned my business around, you know, and, and a lot more people heard about the homemade products that we were making, about the smoked bacon that we were making, uh, the Swedish potato sausage. I had people that drove from Ames, which was basically three hours away, and they started doing that every year. And they're coming to Malvern for one reason, to, to get their yearly supply of that. I had people that came from Bellevue, Nebraska, and Bellevue, Iowa. One's on the Missouri River, one's on the Mississippi River, you know, in the same day. You know, when I talked to customers, I would say, I know that you just drove 50 miles. I know that you passed a dozen grocery stores that you could have gone to in that time, but you chose to come to my store. You know, you get to know the customers, you talk to them, you make it personal personal with them and you know you make that connection with your customers and and that means a lot um i commented that i advertised on radio and what i would do is i had i would get a certain number of 30 sex spots uh, that that we gained each month with our payment but we would stockpile those for times of the year where it was more important you know maybe graduation uh things like that the holidays, especially Christmas. We'd save up so many of those commercials. But then I also had a live three-minute infomercial that we did each week with the, the radio host. And they'd call and, and talk to me a couple of times. I actually went, this is in Shenandoah, about 25 miles away. And I'd go, I'm, I was on live with them each week. And we'd talk about these different things that we're doing. We'd talk about, you know, I've got a new batch of our bacon that just came out of the smoker, the smoked turkeys that we did. Uh, for the holidays. At one point, I had every person that we'd ever done a smoked turkey for had gotten at least one more after that because they enjoyed it so much. You know, but but being able to bring those customers and, and getting out on the radio and, you know, I, I use different forms of advertising in different ways. You know, I had my full page newspaper ad that just about any grocery store is going to have, but we could we, we wrote it ourselves so I could put my homemade products in there instead of just having the uh, four-page color flyer that the warehouse sends out and, and it changes everything up. You know, my, the previous owner was doing that. And one of the reasons that didn't work is, you know, this week they've got this type of hot dog in ad and you've got to get a certain number of them in to try to please everybody. Well, you've got leftovers. Well, the next week they've got another type of hot dog in the ad. And okay, now I've these leftovers aren't going to sell because this one's on sale. Or they had 16 ounce lunch meat on sale this week and a 12 ounce this week. And, you know, it it made so much more sense for me to write my own ads. I could base it off of what they had on sale, but I could put in the things that I want. And if I didn't want to be switching up those, those lunch meats, those hot dogs, all of those different things, I wasn't forced to. Mm. You know, I advertised my own specialty things, but I could also look and say, I've got too many of this thing. And it's going to be outdated if I don't do something with that soon. Boom, it's in my ad. I just sold 80% of what I was talking about. 
And I'm not going to be forced to worry about that getting outdated. You know, we did that with a pro with the print ad. With our radio ad, we're talking about these specialty products that we make. We're talking about the gourmet steaks that we've got. You know, we're going to hand cut steaks for you. If you want three in a package, that's what you're going to get, that type of thing. These people are looking for more high-end things. They're coming from further away. They've got more money to spend. You know, and you know, I, I used that type of thing. There's also free social media and using Facebook to talk about, hey, we just took this out of the smoker. We just made a batch. I, I small town, but we made a stuffed chicken breast and we sold 60 of them within two hours because I put it up on Facebook and everybody's watching that. I had people that came in two and a half later. Yeah, I need some of those. Sorry, they're gone. You know, and, and learning what is going to work, learning to you know try to keep in contact with your customers. I couldn't carry everything, but I'd get the most uh, valuable things. I'd get the most common things, uh, the most popular things, because I talked to the customers and I saw what they wanted. You know, it's a small town store, so I can't carry everything. But, you know, we, we did what worked best for our customers. And, you know, that's what made us stronger and made us, you know, a go-to grocery store for so many people. In our neighboring community, 11 miles away, has two grocery stores. But we had a lot of customers that came from that town and came over and shopped with us. And then hit the other businesses also. Those, those tax dollars helped our community a lot. So... Yeah. You got to think about that type of thing. Well, and that's such a beautiful example where the impact that you think you're having, like I'm going to, I'm going to run a grocery store, like the impact that you think you're having and the impact that you're actually having can be two completely different things where like, it's really, yes, you running your grocery store, but the ripple effects of what that actually means for your community, for the people who live there, for the other business owners, like you're saying, like it's so much bigger than just what you can personally like see and experience of your own impact. And so, yeah, I love like keeping that in mind that there is all of these other things happening kind of as an offshoot of what you're doing. So I, I absolutely love that you went there. Um, what year was the, the pitch contest? When was that? That was in 2013. Uh, and it, it changed things up. Yeah. Kim Reynolds, the lieutenant governor became governor. She came to my store. You know, Malvern had not had the lieutenant governor or governor in our community since 1972. She came to my store, you know, a few months later. She came to my store three more times over the years, uh, just sometimes because she was close and she wanted to come in and say hello. The people like that, the governor, the lieutenant governor, they try to hit all 99 counties each year. That's what Mount, that's what Iowa has is 99 counties. So, you know, that was part of their pledge to be visible and stuff. Well, it wasn't my community they were coming to normally when they're visiting our county. Now they were there a lot more often. Um, you know, I had uh, the secretary of agriculture in my store. I had the state auditor in my store the lieutenant governor, the governor, you know, so many more executives uh, that, that we hadn't had in our community or ever in my store. We had a lot of other things that were happening that were improving the community and making a name for it. And, you know, we, we fed off of that and did a lot. You know, you were talking about the impact and that contest had a huge impact on my my business, on my life, and on my community. But there's been other things in my business that have shown the impact a lot more. You know, I commented earlier when I described where my town is. You know, we're about 15 miles from the Missouri River. Uh, my county abuts the Missouri River. 2019 on St. Patrick's Day. The county flooded. You know, it didn't come clear over to my town, but the Missouri River was, I, I had a classmate whose parents lost everything in the town called Pacific Junction. Seven miles away from the river, they were under six feet of water. 
the neighboring town that I've commented about, Glenwood, is five, six, seven times bigger than my community. Their water treatment plant was underwater. That community had no way to have you know, water on tap for people. The day that all of this happened, we had just received a pallet of 24 packs of water. And I took one of my employees, we loaded as much as we could into my pickup and we went over and gave those to the community. Took them into city hall. Others were doing the same thing. My customers heard, you know, and I put this on Facebook that we're, we're doing a good thing. My customers heard what we were doing. People started bringing me money. Said, and, and, you know, unfortunately, this flooding and this went on for over six months. You know, it was it was the worst natural disaster to hit my county that we've ever had. Mm. Um, they had so many people that lost their homes, that were displaced from their homes, that were living in a shelter over in Glenwood in the in the old armory. Uh, people were coming in and giving me money, saying, you can get the things that they need. You do what you can. People would bring in $200 in cash, $500 in cash. They didn't ask for a receipt. They, they just trusted me. I got $1,000 from a couple of different people. You know, and over many, many months, we, we picked up a lot of things. You know, the contest that I won earlier, Delta Dental, was one of the main uh, sponsors of that. And I called them up. I said, my county is in as real problems. We've got a lot of people that have lost everything. I said, when I won that contest, one of the prizes was you donated a few hundred toothbrushes to the charity that I chose. I said, we need something like that again. They said, we already have. You know, your county has reached out. I said, thank you. But I wanted to use my voice. I wanted to try. You know, I had a slight connection here, so I wanted to do what I could. I contacted my warehouse. You know, these, these people are all living here and they're feeding them, you know, hundreds of people a day. I contacted my warehouse or they started contacting me, said, we've got cases of hot dogs that, you know, the expiration date is only two weeks away. So we need to move these fast. Instead of $35 a case, we'll sell them you for five. Lunch meats that used to be $25 a case, I'm getting for three, I'm getting for seven, something like that. You know, we, we took pickup loads of things like that, that they needed to feed all of these people over to Glenwood. People gave me about $8,000 in contributions, in donations, how much, how much was it? and over the time, about $8,000. But we turned that into about $80,000 worth of product that we took over there. I gained customers from that. That's not what I was trying to do. I was trying to help people. You know, I had the connections. I had the the ability to get these things at a better price than what you're going to be able to you know it's nice if somebody takes a case of green beans over to them but if they can give me five dollars and i can get that that case of green beans so much cheaper than what you had been able to now i just got three cases of green beans for what you would have gotten one for you know and and that's when i realized the impact that i can have when I was young, I read a book and it was it was just a, a kid's sports book. But there was a thing in there and one of the, the characters commented, he said, he's telling about the term noblesse oblige, uh, which is a French term. And it basically meant he who can should. He's talking about why he helped somebody else because he had the ability, because he could. And I've always remembered that. And that's what I was trying to do here. I have the connections. So it isn't anything too hard for me to do this, but I can do it so much easier than somebody else. So I did. Yeah. And as I said, we gained so many customers. You know, when these people are able to live on their own again or whatever, they remembered the kindness that that we showed. They remembered the support and the way that we went out of our way to help. And you know, it helped my business in the long run. 
But a year after that, COVID hit. And there's people out of jobs. There's people that, that can't work. And again, people started coming in and bringing money to me. I had a gentleman come in at one point, and my only connection with him so far was they had moved to town and they had come in and they had written a bad check. It bounced. But before I even knew about that, they'd written a second check and it bounced. I tried to get the money out of them. You know, I went to the, the trailer that they were living in and, you know, I, they didn't have it. There's just nothing that they could do and, and forgot about it. You know, I've been very lucky in the time that, that I've had my store. I only had about, I think, five bad checks in all of these years. And that was two of them. Now COVID has hit and this guy comes in to talk to me. He said, I heard that you can help some people. I said, you know that I know who you are and what you've done to me in the past with those bad checks. I said, so I assume if you're coming to me, you must be desperate. He said, yeah, I am. I said, come back in an hour. We had filled a grocery cart up with the things that he needed, with things that are going to make a lot of different meals with it. I mean, there was about $150 for the products in there. But this, I used the money that other people had given me. And, you know, we sent him on his way. You know, much later, long after COVID, you know, there was a lot of other things that happened because of COVID. But much later, his life turned around. He got a good job. He became one of my best customers. So it paid it back. And he told me one day, he said, I remember those checks. He said, I'm going to get those taken care of. And I said, I've forgotten about it. I said, we're long past that. I said, pay it forward. Help somebody else out when you can. You know, COVID hit. And, you know, very early on first, March was a, a record month for us because of all the panic buying. We were kind of watching people. We put limits on toilet paper. We put limits on some of the other things. You don't need to fill your garage with these. All of the stores in the big city, all of the stores on the news, they're all out of all of these things. And we still had it for weeks yet because I had watched things. I had purchased ahead and, uh, you know, we didn't have that issue. But they're talking about COVID and not understanding everything yet. And I'm hearing that if one of my employees comes down with it, anybody that's been in contact with that employee is going to have to quarantine for 10 days, two weeks, something like that. Well, in my small store, that means that if one of my employees gets it, we're going to have to shut down because I'm going to have everybody or maybe everybody but, but two people under quarantine, you know, at best. So even though grocery stores were considered essential, I made the decision to close the store, close the front doors, and we did curbside only. The news channels from Omaha came down and did a story on that. The, you know, and, and we didn't know what we were doing. We had never done this before. Now we're making our customers, you know, call in their order, email in their order. You know, I'm going on Facebook Live and, and walking around the store and trying to remind them about some of the things we've got on the shelf. We really had a tough time those first couple of days. Uh, it was exhausting. We, my employees were running. We had employees that were emailing their order in. And, you know, the email address may just say big red at AOL.com. Well, I don't know who this is. They didn't put their name on it. They didn't put their phone number on it. And the order says, I need milk. Well, how much milk? What size? You know, I need bread. Uh, give me some ground beef. You know, we, we had to train our customers. We had to wait for them to email us back and say, you've got to give us a phone number. And, uh, you know, it took time. 
you know, we bought a whole bunch of clipboards, more than we ever needed before, because now I've got five employees walking around the store trying to check off lifts and, and get things rung up. We we're learning how to mark those things and put them in the cooler. And, and uh, you know, this order's got two bags in the cooler and three in the freezer and, and two in this cart up front. Yeah, there were times that we missed certain things in the freezer, in the cooler, because, you know, we didn't have them marked well enough and we had to learn how to do it. Our uh, Secretary of State for Iowa started doing a shout out for businesses that were going above and beyond to keep their customers safe. The first business that they did that for was little old Mall Hall and Grocery in Malvern, Iowa. Because, you know, of the things that we were trying to do to keep our community safe, keep our customers safe, and stay in business. CNN did a story online about should grocery stores be closed now? You know, are they, you know, with all of the customers that come in a grocery store each day, then, you know, they've got to be a beehive of activity and a breeding ground for COVID very possibly. You know, stores are trying to learn. These big chain stores have, uh, you know, lots of lawyers and lots of uh, executives in offices someplace that are working on learning how to do that. They've got IT specialists that are trying to set things up online. And here's, they did a story online and, and you know, talked about three different grocery stores of different sizes all around the country. And we were one of them. CNN did a story on Mulholland's. Now they're talking to me. They want to have me on TV. And we've got that all set up because they want to learn how we're doing it and how we're trying to take care of our community. Well, it got they something big happened about an hour before and, and they cut out our segment and, and decided it wasn't going to happen. So, you know, I didn't make that on TV, but we were still there. Customers, you know, I'm still on the radio. I'm telling people what we're doing. We gained so many new customers from all of the surrounding communities, from, from Omaha, from 40, 45 miles away, that uh, they'd pull up out front, and they'd, they'd honk, and they'd roll down their windows that here's a list. You know, and then we'd get done, and, and you know we've got our mask on, and we're put it in the trunk. There's a check in there. I wrote it for $10 extra for all of your trouble. You know, things like that were happening, you know, where, where the customers are pulling up out front, I'll be there at two o'clock uh, and, and coming down to get the groceries. We had to shorten our hours because, you know, we just were exhausting ourselves with what we were doing. March, as I said, was a record month. April was not too bad. Um, May came and some of the bigger stores are opening back up, but we weren't. And I just didn't think it was safe yet. May was our worst month we ever had by a big margin. And we made the decision we had to reopen our doors on June 1st. Boom, we were right back to where we had been before. We've got a lot of new products in the store because we've gained these new customers. Uh, and also because we couldn't get, you know, if everybody remembers, there were so many shortages. And we were dealing with ordering you know, 300 cases of different products to come in for the store on our delivery, and we get 130. My Tuesday morning, I was supposed to get a delivery at 7 a.m. on Tuesday morning. There were times that didn't come until Thursday. My next delivery order had to be in Thursday morning. I haven't even got this one yet. So, you know, I don't know what I'm going to be getting, things like that. Uh, we closed at five o'clock, 530, I guess it was during COVID. And I get a phone call from one of my employees at nine o'clock on a Wednesday night. Uh, my parents just saw the semi go by. They lived out on the north edge of town and said, you know, our delivery's coming. We didn't even know that. He called a couple of other employees, you know, when, when groceries come in, yes, I can set those cans of green beans off to the side. They don't have to be dealt with. But all of the cheese, all of the meat, all of those those frozen pot pies or whatever, the ice cream, that needs to be dealt with now. Yeah. My employees came, you know, and, and they did what they needed. We worked until 1030 that night. We're busting our butts. We're sweating like crazy because we're running so hard trying to get things put away, get them where they need to be, and we'll deal with these other things later. 
but the employees did that. I started yelling at my warehouse because they were doing things to us like that, that they, they weren't keeping us in the loop. Well, that Tuesday morning delivery, you know, I just have to have an idea of when it's coming. And hopefully during our regular hours, because I can't keep asking my employees to help at, at all of these odd times, they did it. But I knew that they were going to be tired of it. And, you know, I, I couldn't believe how generous they were with their times. I did everything I could to give them bonuses, things like that, to make sure that they were taken care of. But it was hard, you know, and, and uh, things finally got better with the warehouse. But it was only after lots of frustration. Mm. You know, I know that I changed as a person. I was never... You see people that are that you would just describe as angry that are gonna you know yell about any little thing that happens. And that's what I was becoming because of the pressures, the stress that I was under, because of not knowing if I was gonna get any of this, you know, not having any any certain things that we needed for our customers for weeks at a time. You know, we're trying to find a substitute, you know, I can't get the tortillas that we normally carry. So what else is available? Yeah. You know, and, and there were so many more hours spent on that type of thing than what it had been before. When groceries would come in, my employees would take a yellow highlighter. The invoices would still show the items that we ordered but didn't get. And they'd start using a yellow highlighter on all of those things. We'd have whole pages where there might be one line where we actually did get the item. I can remember one time that, you know, I ordered, I, I started keeping percentages of the different departments, you know, and, and we didn't hit 50% on any of the departments mm. for quite a while. But there were times where we got 12% of what we ordered for the dairy. You know, I ordered 40 cases and, and I got six, yeah. things like that. And, and, you know, trying to keep, trying to use Facebook Live to keep the customers in the know. I said, we're trying, we're trying to get things here. I couldn't get the Tropicana orange juice, but we got Simply Orange, you know, so you know what we do have, you know, that we're doing the best that we can. And, and I don't have what we've normally carried, but here's a good substitute. You know, and again, we have all of these new customers that are coming in. Hey, I used to buy this over here. Can you get that? Okay. So we tried. And as I said, we picked up a lot of new products that worked for us also. Some of them were just a temporary substitute. Some of them, we learned that it was going to work for us. And, and you know, we used that knowledge and experience and, and changed the store up in ways like that. So, again... Gaining new customers because we're doing what was necessary, what was helpful for our customers. And they remembered, you know, some of them, I had a few people, you know, I, when we did reopen, we required masks. I had a guy that used to be sheriff in our county came in one day and I said, I'm, I'm sorry, sir, you need to put a mask on. Oh, to hell with you. And stormed out. Well, I'm sorry I lost you as a customer but I just kept six other people safe. You know, it isn't about me being right. It's about me being able to keep my store open yeah. to help you in the long run. So I wasn't trying to, you know, lord it over anybody. You would be a dictator. I'm just trying to do what's best for everybody. And the way that I see it with the information that we've got at this time. Yeah. Which is almost none. Like you said, yeah. like we don't know anything. Yeah. I, I had a tendon snap in my wrist about this time. So I'm, I'm at a doctor in Omaha and, and you know, I, I get there early. I run across the street to the hardware store. Do you have any plexiglass so that we can hang dividers down in front of the customers? And, and you know, the guy that does that is out to lunch. I said, this is what I want ordered that. They said, it'll be about an hour. I said, fine. Got to go to the doctor. I come back. I pick it up. And he said, you're lucky you came when you did. He said, that was it. 
spun out. And I see people all over Facebook, all over social media. Does anybody know where I can get some? All of these business owners are trying and, and it's gone. You know, you can't find it anywhere. I got lucky. Yeah. You know, there's been so many times that I've, I've been lucky and, and uh, you know, I know it and I appreciate it. Mm. Mm. Yeah, COVID was, it was a game changer, but I think, you know, as hard as it was, no doubt about it, um, for some more than others, what I saw from my store was people were so happy if you just showed up and did your best. They were so yeah. forgiving. They were like, Yes. So open to the substitute product. They're so open to calling and being like, hey, so my curbside order was supposed to have a couple cases of pop. Do you still have that? Yeah, yeah, I do. It's right here. And we didn't grab it with your order. Okay, well, I'll run back in there and get it tomorrow. Don't worry about it. Just put my name on it. Like, no, yeah. <clears throat> almost nobody was mad. And there were a couple who were just, yeah, exactly. Whoa, man. Like, what is Nin- 98% of the customers were extremely thankful. Yes. You know, absolutely. and, you know, 90% of the customers. I, I grew up carrying out groceries and, and sacking groceries. And in all of that time, I probably got one or two tips. You know, I'm, I'm not standing there with my hand out or whatever. I just, I wasn't raised that way. And I know that in some areas, you're going to get that more. But probably 90% of our customers now are tipping, are adding more to their order, you know, rounding it up, whatever. Yeah. But because they appreciated them, because they knew that we were doing everything that we could. As I said, we had that 2% that screw you, sorry, but, you know, which I gained more than I lost. I agree. Exact same is that there were a very, very small percentage who didn't like the restrictions that we had put in place. And we did so much of the same stuff you did. I, it's uncanny. Yeah. Um, but the ones who were verbally like supportive of, that's why we're coming here is because you're doing this because you're making sure that your people are safe, that the customers are safe. Like I was on Facebook live talking to them, like, you know, I'm, I'm doing what I can. And they were like, I'm coming here because you guys are like the calm in the storm, like the eye of the storm. And there is, there is that relief that they could have access to. And that was worth something to them that has nothing to do with groceries. You know, just knowing that they're safe when they come there was huge. Right. I had commented earlier about the Facebook group that I'm in. Yes. I had never done a Facebook Live. Mm. And, you know, all of these business owners in different industries or whatever, we're all asking questions because we're, we're all facing a lot of the same type of things. And there were so many that had it worse than what I did. You know, there were so many businesses that they were shut down. Right. You know, they're they're state said you can't have you know you don't need to have this open and you're not an essential business uh things like that you know so i was lucky but these people taught me how to do facebook live i've never done that before but it's necessary now you know the word pivot you know came up and and you know enough that you got sick of it but but uh seriously that's what we're all doing we're trying to figure out different ways that we could take care of our customers and you know, I'm I'm holding the camera up here and I'm walking down the aisle and I'm showing you, oh, hey, we get a new type of wine in over here. Uh, you know, we we have not been able We're trying. We have not been able to get this lately. It's been out of my warehouse for six weeks now. But over here, we do have this, you know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and people would comment on there. Hey, do you happen to have that? You know, do you happen to have this? Can you get that? You know, and, and the support was there as I said, from 98% of the people. But again, we're, we're learning. You know, the uh, area chamber of commerce over in Glenwood started growing. It became, it's now the Mills County Chamber. So that, you know, I've been, I, I've joined that and I've gotten more out of it than what my dues have been over the years, you know, with the help that they've given me. And they're supporting all of the businesses. There's a, there's a picture of me, uh, carrying out groceries with my mask on and there's a sign beside me from the chamber, you know, support local, you know, and, and that's, that's what it was all about. And, and as I said, May was our worst month ever, but the year still finished up 
very good because June came back immediately and, and yeah. you know, things were we, so much better. We closed pretty much the same timeline. We closed, it was about March 15th that we closed and started doing curbside and delivery only. And then we reopened for the same exact reason um, the beginning of June. It was like June 10th or 11th, something like that. Yeah. Um, and when we reopened, it was like, ding, like, there you go. Like they all were like right there, like ready to come back. And yeah, I think just like anything else in the grocery business, it was like listening to what they needed because the first couple months it was like, there were people coming to Cecil or to our store just because that's what we were doing. And then by month three, there were people who were not coming because that's what we were doing. And they were loud enough with their not coming that we were like, okay, yep. we're back. <laughs> Hello, wear your mask, please. You know, like, and it was so much about safety. Like, I'm not trying yeah. to be a hard ass for no good reason. I, I was in the same boat you were thinking we actually split into two teams so that it was never everybody there at the same time because that's how it was before. And like, if we caught one, Very case, good. we're all done. And so we had yeah. a like a three day and a four day and we kind of take turns switching back and forth and we operated half and half. And we did that for, you know, several months, even after we reopened. Um, and, oh, yeah, grocery and COVID, I feel like we could honestly do a whole deep dive sometime just into oh, that. Yeah. Because holy moly, like what we learned and all the pivots and everything else, it was such a transformative time um, that, yeah, I would love to dive back into that at some point. But as we, you know, we we kind of pre-planned it a little bit so that we would leave everyone here on a bit of a cliffhanger moment. Um, and then we're going to come back with a part two to the to kind of continue with the story. But do you want to get us get us familiar with what is, you know, as much of a turning point and as much of a transformation as COVID was, that wasn't the main turning point in the story that that was still to come. So give us a brief taste of that and we'll come back to that on, on next episode. One more quick thing about the COVID. Yes, please. You know, I talked about my boss in Omaha was so fantastic. You know, he retired about three months before COVID hit. And I'm thinking six months later about him and he's worked 50 years in the grocery industry. He's you know so smart, so intelligent so experienced at what he does and i'm facing things that he never even thought of yeah. and never had to experience or deal with you know when and everybody in my industry is now you know so that was that was a big change too. what you're talking about the the big changes in my story you know covid hit in 20 2020 and you know, it, it kind of changed things. And we went through, we had a good, ended up the year well. 2021, you know, we're having another good year. And personally, I was having a lot of, of issues. In mid-December, December 13th, I'd come home. And I'm now alone at home. I'd just been home about 15 minutes. And I got a phone call. And they said, you've got to get back down here. The store's on fire. And it burned to the ground that night. So that really has changed a lot of things for me. I can't, oh. can't imagine, you know? And that's what the next episode is for, is for unpacking this wild ride of making an impact and how there can be a hairpin left turn at any moment and that possibly and I you know I've heard a little bit of your story and I'm excited to hear more next time but possibly you know even when there is a dark cloud that comes like maybe there's a silver lining and that you know, every single stage along the way plays its role in the ultimate impact that we're here to make. And that sometimes, like, like I said at the beginning, it's not bright and shiny and happy and fluffy. Like sometimes it freaking sucks and you're standing there with your heart breaking. And 
you don't give up because <laughs> like that's not what this is like you keep going but how do I keep going this is so hard and that's what I really want to get into next time is is the resilience that it takes to stay on the path so Tom thank you so much for this first installment I've so enjoyed getting to know you better and am excited for Oh, next time, like we'll, we'll be ready for next time. It's, it's going to be a, a big one, I think, to get to hear the the full details of that part of the journey for you and kind of get fully up to speed with where we're at now. And so all of that will be here for next time. Um, there's also a trailer that I just recorded. Actually, I recorded it the same day that we're recording this, June 21st, 2023, um, but I'm guessing this episode is going to be released much later than the trailer. So if you haven't yet, check out the trailer because that is a nice little overview of kind of what this podcast is. And as we as we set sail, um, you know, to mix my metaphors here, as we build the plane while we're flying it, we're going to continue to figure out exactly how we're going to navigate along this path. Like I told Tom before we started recording, we're going to wander and see where we end up. Um, I do thank you for watching. Feel free to like and follow and all of that really helps to support this finding other people out there who are ready to hear it. Um, I do thank you for sharing it wherever feels good for you to share it. And until next time, do take care of yourself. I hope you'll be thinking a little bit about what might be even just one small act, one small resource that you have that you could make a phone call and cause a ripple effect of, of positivity out into the world? Um, I, I do believe very strongly, as you'll probably come to know, that we all have something that we can give. So thank you so much again for joining us and we'll see you next time.